The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Randy Howell, Trader State of Mind, and I am so happy to see you. And first, let's start just with the basics. One, can you hear me? If someone would please type in a couple whys, I would really appreciate it so that I know that I'm not talking just off into the ether someplace. Yes. Okay. Well, first of all, just want to do a few ground rules. If you've been attending my stuff for very long, you realize that I hold questions to the end. I make a presentation and I try to leave between five and 10 minutes for if you have questions to ask them. But I'm going to also address one particular question I got today, uh, actually in this particular thing. And I, I um, it's really about trusting the self, trusting your system. And here's actually what a guy who just signed up with me today said. Randy, the problem is that we all think we can do this on our own. We're looking for the easy way to make money. And it is really hard to look at the self. In my work, ultimately what happens is it's about learning to recognize the problem and the solution to your trading is you. When you look at your trading account, what you're looking at, the health of it, what you're looking at is your beliefs about your ability to manage uncertainty. You're seeing them, whether or not they're effective at pulling more capital out of the markets than they give back. So my answer is this, is the problem always is the last person to the last person to acknowledge it, the problem is yourself and your trading, is there are a number of quite good uh, trading coaches, and it all comes down to whether or not you're ready to say, am I willing to build a mind to be able to trade? My promise to you is the trading mind is completely different than the mind that would have brought you success in trading. The guy that just signed with me today is an enormously successful guy, young too. And what he's realized is that alpha, that drive, that push that allowed him to excel and make a lot of money in his businesses is the detriment to him in trading. And what we want to do today is to find what is the missing key to become a disciplined trader. And where we want to start is recognizing that head knowledge, which everybody confuses with, if I get enough head knowledge and I'm gonna be a successful trader, and emotional knowledge in trading have to work together for success. It's not gonna happen because you want it to, or you're real smart, or you have a, knowledge, a lot of knowledge. There are plenty of traders who have knowledge, but when the money is real, they fall flat on their faces. They can't integrate intellectual knowledge with emotional knowledge. And in this graphic, what you're looking at is going, what I have to do is I have to take my new brain, my thinking brain, and I have to take my emotional brain, and I have to learn how to build a very different partnership between them in the engagement of uncertainty. Why? Because your brain is organized around fear. Even before we were humans, Beyond 6.5 million years ago, most animals were organized around fear, okay? And uncertainty was dangerous. The deal is, the really missing key is how do you bring those two elements, head knowledge and heart knowledge together and produce the kind of mind that can work in probabilities and not just get absolutely a little triggered to instinctive fear reactions or aggression reactions when uncertainty produces vulnerability. And it starts right here. As simple as this looks like, you know, basically what you're looking at is the inside of a brain, inside of a mind, and you're looking at this geeky little guy driving a car, driving the brain, and he's got all this knowledge all stuffed in there, and he absolutely isn't even aware that there's an emotional brain back in the back seat. Right now, in the back seat, that emotional brain is not being stimulated. It's not perceiving threat in the environment. 
And as long as you can do that, and this is why paper trading, so many people can do paper trading, they can mint money. And then as, as, as soon as it gets real, what happens is your experience of uncertainty under stress produces a fear of losing your life. Not just losing a little capital. To the emotional brain, it doesn't know about money. It knows about the loss of life. It knows about the struggle of living and the danger. And here's this geeky little guy driving down the road thinking everything's just fine and dandy, thank you. And here's an emotional brain sitting back in the back seat. Seems so tame. The moment, though, you add the prospect of loss of capital, everything changes. You get hijacked. All this rational stuff is hijacked by fight flight. And the key is, is well, if you know that guy is in the back seat, if you know that emotion, your emotional brain has to be attended to, and yet you continue to ignore, you continue to ignore how do I develop the emotional brain to complement, to complement my thinking brain? How do I do that? Well, that's what we're here to really look at. And this is what happens. We're trying to get this next slide, please. We're having a little slide around. All those cognitive resources that you have, all that really smart stuff, all those courses you've taken, all that knowledge you can spout out about trading and actually at a cocktail party sound like you know what you're doing is blown out of the water the moment that emotional brain experiences uncertainty. Particularly, your brain is already organized to experience uncertainty as a threat, and it demands action now for survival in the, back, in the short term. So once you realize this, you go, how does this work? How does this work? What I want to do, I want to show you exactly what happens. You're looking at a graph right now that explains exactly what the problem is that you're having with trading. If you don't, if you're scared to enter trades, okay, or if you get just annoyed that there's not an opportunity there and all of a sudden you look other places and jump into things, understand, you call that aggression. You call that urgency to enter, but ultimately it's all about mattering. I've got to make money to matter. So it's actually a fear. And then if you, when the trade goes against you, if you just lose your cool, if you have gotten to money and then take the money as fast as you can so that you're not, so it doesn't get taken away from you, that's caveman brain too. That's the system. Okay, I have, a, I have someone who says he cannot hear. If people will just check in again and let me know if they can hear me or not. Just say yes. We can hear you fine. Okay. So we can hear me fine. So I would. So good here. We can find that's that's the problem you're going to have to figure out now. So what we're looking at and say, what is this mechanism that turns a perfectly reasonable mind, rational mind into insanity so quickly? Well, here it is right here. And this is what the thinking brain does not see that's right in front of his face. This is the key about understanding the way the emotional brain dominates thinking. First of all, when you see the sensory thalamus down there in the uh, bottom left-hand corner, what you're looking at is part of the limbic system. And it's the place where all the data is coming streaming in from your, sense, uh, from your senses. We call it sensorial information or emotional stimulus comes in and at that moment, the thalamus is making a quick and dirty decision. And it's often called by the traffic cop, where if you could imagine a traffic cop in a busy signal, busy sig city, and he's routing the traffic this way and that way and all this stuff, and he's doing all that really cool stuff that traffic cops probably used to do. And then an emergency vehicle shows up on the scene. You can hear it. And all of a sudden, what happens is that traffic cop stops everything and lets the emergency vehicle through. That's exactly what happens when the information coming into the thalamus is seen as dangerous, as a threat. What it does at that particular time, that traffic cop stops traffic. It hijacks mine. It hijacks 
the feed going into the new brain, the thinking brain, and it immediately fires on this low road that takes nanoseconds to get to the amygdala that triggers the emotional response of fight flight. That's what's happening, friends. It's not like it's hiding. It's sitting there and the thinking brain has a very hard time seeing it. And for a lot of traders, they don't want to admit the problems with them. And what's really weird, it's nothing personal. This is our caveman brain. This is the brain we brought that was highly operational 20,000 years ago. It was necessary. The problem is we built a completely different environment than it was designed for. And the thalamus is still saying, oh, this is danger. I'm in the jungle. And what we had, we had these danger things coming on. I had to quit thinking and I need to move to action. I need to move the emotions that force action right now. Now, that's what happens when the emotional stimuli and data is deemed a threat. If you are working with uncertainty, everything's a threat. Do you see the dilemma? I mean, if you're sitting there scared to get into a trade because, oh my God, what if I lose to the sensory thalamus? Oh my God, that means, oh, what if I die? I'm doing something so dangerous I could die. I better shoot that over to the amygdala to be able to produce some sort of fear that would allow me to avoid getting killed. So you don't, you get all this confirmation and the trade passes you. It's that kind of stuff. Meanwhile, let's say the information, the data comes into the thalamus and it's not threatening. Translated. Either the trade's not real or it hadn't warmed up enough or you're pa paper trading and it doesn't see the loss of capital, the paper, as a threat because it's going to see the loss of money as a threat to its being, its life. So what it does is it lets the information go to the thinking brain, the sensory cortex. How long does that take? 0.25 seconds. How long does a short route to the amygdala from the sensory thalamus take? 0 0.003 seconds. What you're hearing is that the emotions already hit the amygdala, it is already activated into an emotional chemistry, and is in the body changing the way you perceive and think before the information even gets to the thinking brain to deliberate. It didn't take the lo lo uh, long route, it hijacked it. And from there though, is that the, the power, when it says hippocampus, what I want you to recognize, that's really where, that's the memory centers, and it's gonna have memories that has been built about threats and about opportunity. And so that feed is being built on that from memory. And you've got, to, you've got to be able to manipulate that in order to be able to route the information to the long route to the thinking brain or what I call sage impartiality rather than it going to the low road to the fight flight process. Now, you know that fight flight process by not getting into the trade, by jumping into trades, by just losing your cool when the trade goes against you and doubling down bad trades and all that stuff, or not willing to take, taking the profits when it gets green and leaving money on the table, or taking a loss and getting really angry and wanting to get that money back, or winning and immediately going back and finding another one to just stomp on it. Yeah, that's what it looks like, friends. That's your caveman brain. That's not you as this modern geeky driver of the car, but that's the brain that you bring to the arena that was very useful up until about 10,000 years ago. Remember, 10,000 years ago, we had still had saber-toothed tigers. So you can see the danger of the jungle was very present. And we have a brain that's wired to protect us from the jungle, the dangers in the jungle. We can't think that way if we're going to be successful traders. Completely different. It's the difference between short-term thinking and long-term thinking. Certainty-based thinking where I'm going to win and probability-based, I have an edge I could win. The key though, how do you get to the mind that can get and break through this particular survival strategy the brain has developed 
over many, many, many millions of years. Remember, when your brain encounters uncertainty, it's programmed to experience vulnerability, which produces a lot of confusion, and that's where it immediately goes to the amygdala in fight flight, and all of a sudden, rational thought is just blown out of the water. This pathway has to be interrupted first before anything can change. So, the truth, and this is something that we prove every day here, is that with some effort, it doesn't come, it doesn't come easy. You can, in fact, train your brain to respond very differently to uncertainty. You can. However, what most people don't understand is that the response to your brain's response to uncertainty is a state trait. It's been so wired in, so successful that it's a trait. It's not going to change. However, you can find workarounds that allow you to interrupt process and to be able to find a workaround that allows you to respond to uncertainty very differently than the mammalian brain that you have as the emotional brain is going to. This is just the way evolution set it up. You know, it's not, again, it's not your fault, but it is your responsibility to recognize that you might want to think you can push through this. You may want to think that I can do it myself. You may want to think I can just, you know, I can learn this. I'm going to push, I'm going to push. I'm going to find the right teacher. I'm going to find this, I'm going to find that. Only to find out that as a highly evolved mammal, you are still stuck with a mammalian brain facing facing danger, okay? And that is not good boating for being able to work with the brain you need for trading. Here's the deal. The big deal is that you're going to have to take your sense of worth as a human being, and you're going to have to separate it from performance. You're going to have to be able to say, you know something? Like, for instance, with Alphas, this guy that just signed with me this afternoon is an incredibly successful entrepreneur. He's an alpha. He makes things happen. He pushes. He does that. And then he's got into trading and found out that all that is blowing himself up. But what he's learned over time and what drives him is that he has to win to matter. He has to make money to matter. The belief I have to win produces the truth. You know, suddenly you have a belief that is not rooted in reality. It's rooted in a belief that produces a truth. And then when you challenge it in your trading account, you discover it's no, it just doesn't work that way. So you're looking at that and going, well, you mean I'm going to have to take deep-seated emotional beliefs about my ability to manage uncertainty, and I'm going to have to find workarounds and reorganize them so that they become higher-functioning beliefs that can work with uncertainty rather than crave certainty. Yes, that's exactly what you're going to have to do. Yeah. Is it going to be easy? Of course not. What you're looking at right here is actually a really a cool way of understanding the way the brain creates reality. In neurobiology, what is said is that you have never experienced reality out there. What you have experienced is a virtual representation, which you're seeing this woman trying to pull over the rest of reality, that is representational of the world out there. The truth is the brain is in your cranium and has never seen the light of day. It's never experienced anything out there, but it's created from all this data feeds coming into it and its best guesses about what's out there. It creates reality based on the beliefs, the assumptions that have been built into you from the get-go, from evolutionary psychology to the way you were raised in your family. And what you're doing is you're reality testing. You're, you're, you're testing whether or not your sense of reality created by your brain, by virtual representation, is it effective in working with probability? And if you're normal, if you're a regular human being, it's not. Trading is your brain's worst nightmare. 
You're subjecting a brain that was built to control outcome to be right and by any reason not be wrong. And finally, to be able to make predictions, to be able to figure out where something's going to be before it gets there. It's built to do that whether or not it has to lie to itself or not. And what you're doing is this woman is pulling up something that sugarcoats the world she's in. And what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to produce a very different way of being. I, work, I worked with a guy, a very, very fine trader who plays on a pretty big scale. And he showed me this chart and he says, Randy, what, what do you see in here? What do you see? And this guy, you know, this guy's been around 35, 40 years. He, he plays with a, a near 10 figure account. He's, he's a really time trader. And I, and I said, Chris, I, I have no idea. You tell me. And he looks at me and says, I see blood right here. You see it on this chart where all these people are gathering. I'm going to shake them a little bit and they're going to get scared and I'm going to suck their blood. That's a very different observer of the markets than I bet you are. So both are virtual representations that the brain has created, but one is highly effective. And what we're saying is, hmm, at the very bottom of this, it comes down to this, is that winning and losing really are just simply about what side of probability you end on. Instead of in representing your worth or mattering, okay, what it, how in the world can winning or losing really tell you about your being? Well, to the alpha and to the perfectionist, if they're right, then they matter. If they're wrong, it's about their being. It's not about their performance. Do you see this problem that, that we have in separating our performances from our being? It's really interesting. In my work, I work with a concept called inherent worth. And I get at it from a bio biological way of being able to find a deep sense of worth living within you as a trait, not as something you believe, but as a trait that you see that other social mammalians have. This is the beginning of being able to separate your being, your worth as a human being, from your competence as a trader. And this is the number one obstacle in the trading success is they, that it's not natural to divide those to the brain, but it has to be done. It has to be done. So instead of winning and losing, being about your human worth, hello, I'm in control. I, I'm in control of everything. Winning and losing just demonstrates your competencies, which, by the way, can be improved, is the questions that I have a trader asking if they take a loss or a win, by the way, is that um, would I take that trade over again? Same thing. Would I perform the same way? And was this a psychological mistake? Lost my cool. Or is this um, a me method mistake where I really need to really go in and take a look at my rules about how I go about doing this? Or was this just simply probability? Okay, did I just land everything lined up, but my guess was wrong? You know, what you're saying is that, okay, so my performance was an excellent performance, but because it was probability, it had a choice of whether or not it was going to land one way or the other. Meanwhile, we're built to win. We're built to hate losing because, to be honest with you, the brain, the brain doesn't like losing because it doesn't know that it's losing money. It thinks that its very existence is being wired. And here you're looking at that progression. That guy on that computer doesn't recognize that that hominoid way there on the left has the same emotional brain as him. It hasn't changed. And he's bringing that all the way to the computer screen. How do you start interrupting this? How do you start interrupting that? Winning is leaving, is living, losing is losing your life. It starts with emotional regulation and mindfulness to interrupt this instinctual, this instinctual part. And what you discover with emotional regulation, and this is, by the way, the first skill that I teach, I teach it. The first thing I do is I start really talking about 
you don't really understand emotions is that they are biological action potentials and you need to learn how to use them. They take over psychology. And to pretend you don't have emotions is really, uh, boy, good luck. But what you're looking at in emotional regulation is you begin to realize the emotion is biological and that it can be, it can be worked with by your breath, which is part of the emotion, the way you breathe. If you are breathing just up with your top chest, what you're doing is you're asking to be able to trigger fight flight because fight flight is assuming that you don't need to be thinking anymore. Everything be, needs to be going to your big muscles so that you can either fight or flee. By changing to diaphragmatic breathing, what you're doing is you're bringing air down into the lower lobes of the lungs and what you're doing is you're getting a lot more oxygen to the brain, which allows it to regulate itself. The second piece that has to be taught is mindfulness. Mindfulness is when you recognize that you and your thoughts are not the same. It's when you recognize the beliefs that you hold as the truth about you are simply beliefs that you, you fell into. They weren't even yours, okay? They weren't even yours. They just became organized into a potential self, and there you are. That's where the work starts getting very powerful. And then when you take that fear offline through emotional regulation and mindfulness, you start noticing something really interesting. You can start developing inherent strengths living within you. Um, a friend of mine talked about one of the coaches that he was very familiar with. And that coach said, you know something, there's a thousand different voices living within your mind. You have to choose which voices you're going to listen to and to project into the world. Here, what we're doing is we're in this graph, what you're seeing is you're learning, beginning to see that there's an observer of the mind who begins to choose what elements of the spheres of influence in the brain are the emotional programs in the emotional brain are the voices in the mind that you're going to listen to and to organize into the working mind that engages uncertainty. Remember, the brain that you brought is not going to, it's not going to do the job. It's not built for the job. And you're exposing it to its worst nightmare. It will never have control over outcome and it wants control over outcome. So you're going, huh? So you're telling me that I actually need to reorganize not just my brain. But the voices in my mind, yeah, weird stuff. Those voices in the mind, very powerful. Those voices within everybody's mind, within everybody's brain, and this is through evolution, you will find the discipline of a ruler. And what that really means is being able to maintain order under pressure. That discipline's there. Has it been developed? No. Not in the context of trading. You need the courage of a warrior. That means you're acting in the face of fear. It doesn't mean that you don't have fear. It just means that you are willing to face your fears. You feel it, you push through it. And what you're doing is you're protecting what I call the kingdom of the self. The next part that's really powerful is you have to have the self-soothing really called self-compassion of a caregiver. You need to calm down that emotional brain. Otherwise, it's going to short circuit you. It's going to hijack you and send everything to the amygdala. And you're going to continue. You're going to continue doing the same stupid things over and over again and going, how did that happen? I don't understand. This is exactly how it happens. If you manage the self-soothing, the courage and the discipline, the ruler, the warrior, the caregiver, what you're going to end up with <clears throat> is a brain that can access impartiality, clear thinking. That's exactly the brain and the mind that you want trading. You want good information. Because basically, whatever emotional state has gripped you controls the way you think, controls your perception. So you have to be very careful. When you look at a chart, your interpretation of that chart is based on your emotional state and the beliefs that work behind that emotional state. That's where we're going. So, why, if you've, been, if you've been following me so far, why is, so, why is emotion so important? 
I gave it away. All thinking is emotional state dependent. When you engage uncertainty, it isn't about your rational thinking that you can do when you're sitting in armchair quarterbacking on Monday morning. No. What happens is you are now in the frame of like, wow, what emotions are triggering that captivate thinking as I engage the uncertainty of risking real capital? There you go. We develop tunnel vision. We don't recognize that other potentialities live out there. We get locked in and we can't see anything else. We can't see what we can't see. So we're going to have to learn to use, if you're going to be consistently profitable, you're going to have to use emotions to your advantage. You're going to have to manage them so that you bring a peak performance mind to the game of trading rather than the brain and mind that you brought initially. That's, that's what has to happen because this is it. This is your natural response right here. And it was very clear, the big bears and the big cats from yesteryear. Remember, that's just 10,000 years ago. <laughs> what do you think your best response to a cat, 1,300 pounds with six inch incisor teeth that have hooked into the cave where you and your tribe are there and is looking for a meal? Well, the natural response is fear and you want to run. It's actually quite unnatural, but in ancient times, what would happen is women and children would go to the center, men would go to the corners to protect the women and the children from the threat. Men were expendable. You only needed one man to impregnate a bunch of women. But the thing is, it took, you know, once you got pregnant, you had this bottleneck. You had nine months there, and then you had five years to get that kid up to working speed. And then you had this short period once they hit teenagehood for them to arise and become adults and breed their genes into the gene pool and the future of evolution. So you're beginning to see, wow, even the courage that you see was basically a response, a natural selection of being able to face fear even when you feel fear because the truth is somebody had to fight the cat. And obviously we did a good job. We finally extinguished them. But this is a natural response. What we want is a very unnatural response. What we want to do. Oh, okay. Look, I'm going to tell you, there is a, we, we're having this summer, we're having some monster electrical storms here. And if it were to knock out electricity here and this would go down, Come back in in about a minute because we also have an emergency generator that kicks right in. So, any rate, so th I don't think that's going to happen, but that's why we have the emergency generator. And then you have to have that courage of the war. You you really have to face. You know how you know how a lot of people are really uncomfortable waiting for a trade. They, you know, they just start, you know, they get uncomfortable, they start squirming and they, you know, they just, they feel really uncomfortable. And, they, and then before you know it, they want to be doing something, doing something, doing something like trading. You have to be, you have to be trading to be trading when in fact, no, that's not true. But that discomfort of sitting still takes enormous courage to be able to say, what's behind that discomfort of being still? Why can't I be patient rather than rather than have this urgency to get into something. This is where the courage of a warrior is necessary to get under there, to find it, and to be able to start dealing with it effectively. So you really begin to see that there's a lot to this. And probably the most misunderstood emotion in trading is self-compassion. Tell me something. Has anybody in here ever become a better trader by beating themselves up? and just cursing themselves out and belittling themselves after a mistake. No, it just digs the problem deeper. As a matter of fact, the only time that the brain actually learns was when a mistake is made. When you find success, it locks in that pattern and it becomes more resistant to change. So we're saying, okay, when you make that mistake, what you're really doing is opening up the possibility of reorganizing the self to become a better trader. To do that, you're going to have to calm, you're going to have to soothe, you're going to have to nurture that part of the self 
that really doesn't like losing. And you have to be able to separate it from fighting for your life versus feeling discomfort. The brain doesn't know about that. You know, it sees it's fighting for life when, in fact, it's just simply discomfort. Self-compassion is the antidote to fear, friends. It's not courage. It's not going down on it, just being tough. No, if you want to take a fear-based pattern, wow. I don't know if you heard that, but that was a big one, pretty near here. We had a good bolt of uh, thunder there. So we're looking at this and saying, if you want to be successful, consistently profitable in trading, you need to be able to develop a way of having self-compassion for yourself when you take losses rather than building it up. Otherwise, you're training the brain in a very self-defeating way for the next time it runs into uncertainty. Now, we also need the discipline of a ruler. And I chose Abraham Lincoln here in the United States. You know, it was a terrible time in the United States is that we were having a civil war and good people on both sides were killing each other. And what happens, it took, it took a compassionate leadership compassionate discipline to be able to move through that war and to start producing the reconciliation that is that kept the United States glued together. It required that. And this is probably considered Abraham Lincoln, though he's failed almost everything he did, actually became one of the biggest reasons that the United States has experienced the kind of success it has. And now in today's world, we're into a thing where we're realizing that we have armed camps on both sides again. The United States needs an, a really great leader. So we see the need for that, that discipline of a ruler to maintain order. And we also see the need for the lead, that ruler to be able to say, what are the parts of the self that I need to say, I need to lock these guys into a team and they need to be able to do something. You need good leadership inside it. I worked with a... Um, a trader many years, not many years ago, but that, that flew um, a C-117. I don't know if you know what that is. It's a, it's fundamentally a flying football field. And it takes a lot of, it takes a big crew, seven people, to fly the machine because it's really chaotic. And what he had done is he had mistaken the amount of money that the Air Force had gone to find the people to work as a team and then train them so they could operate in the uncertainty of flying that aircraft. And what he came to realize, he said, I've been thinking that I personally was disciplined and confident. I realized that I was part of a team. And now what I have to do is I have to build an internal team built around the discipline of ruler that I was taught. That's when it clicked for him and he became a successful trader. Then the other piece, this is, a, this is actually my representation of the sage that I use. Albert Einstein was a genius, but what happened is that he also, as he aged, he was no longer that genius. He became wise. He became clear-headed. And it's that kind of thing that you also need. You need someone that has wisdom and can make good decisions, can, can take the evidence and say, this is the best probability that we have. What it all looks like together I love the Lord of the Rings because it takes all these emotional energies called archetypes in Jungian talk and starts realizing that the mind is a microcosm of this macrocosm. Suddenly you have a ruler, you have nurturers, you have women warriors, you have sages, and you also have people pulling together. And when you take a look at Frodo, understand he was given the toughest job of all to get the ring of Mordor back and put it into the lava because nobody else could stand the power of that. So you begin to see that within the human is that kind of internal strength. They can band together and create a new committee of the mind, a new governing committee of the mind, very different than the one you brought to trading. And that's what this work is all about because what you really find out is this, is that you're, Brain and mind, as the brain, it's a neighborhood of emotional programs that are duking it out from control to the construction of the cell. 
in the mine, that neighborhood becomes a committee, a governing committee, where various forces are duking it out for control of the direction of the company called you. These are the various voices. Some are destructive, some are constructive. We've gone over those, but let's uh, let's go over let's go over let's go over um, what happens when the bad guys get a hold of it. You ultimately experience when when urgency takes over. You want to get in, want to get in, want to get in. And what I want you to notice: listen to your mind when stuff like get in, get in, get in. You're going to miss this opportunity. Come on, get this money here, get it. And then what happens? You also go, you know, something. I'm, I'm, I've got to have money. I've got to have money. And then all of a sudden you see, oh, it's money's running away. Money's running away. What you're listening to is what I call the inner critic. There's a very destructive part of the self that truly wants your destruction. And if you do not know it's there, and most particularly in America, you learn to ignore this part in, in prosperity, gospel, and positive thinking, you ignore there's this destructiveness that lives within all of us. And if you don't realize it and be, and be vigilant toward it, it sneaks in the back door of the mind, takes over, and blows up the mind just when you think that you finally got it together. Happens all the time particularly when you're winning, the worst thing, you know, most people think the worst thing, Randy, is that if I can just get past fear, I, I'm going to be in really good shape. But I'm saying, no, what happens is when you get past fear, you didn't have to deal with winning. Winning produces an overconfidence, a euphoria, and you make, and you just can't make good decisions. So you're looking at this thing and you're realizing, I have to change the whole thing. But now, instead of just experiencing that self-doubt, you begin to say, oh, the inner critic, that destructive aspect of my being. And then what you're rec also recognizing that there is a, uh, an adapted self that adapts to the threats and things like that around it, that in Jungian talk, is called the orphan. And what most traders do, what most human beings, beings do, is they leave the orphan in the clutches of the inner critic, that negative voice that judges you, that tempts you, that mocks you, all that stuff, and leaves it, leaves it alone with this. And yet that orphan nature of yours desperately needs, desperately needs the committee of the mind, the empowered committee of the mind to redirect it, to have new mentorship. So, there you have it. You know, you look at how many times has this happened to you where in your inner screen, what you're hissing, and you know, when it, it can be that, oh, I'm doing really good. Boy, I'm going to make a lot of money. Oh, I'm just sizing this stuff up. Blah, 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 blah. Danger, danger, danger. Don't listen to that tempter. At the same time, it's also be, oh, you, you're incompetent. You're never going to make it. Why don't you just give up after another loss? What you're seeing is these forces at play. And unless you get really good at identifying and working with them, you're going to stay stuck in the self-learning patterns that produce your current performances. Your job is to reinforce, to reorganize the mind into where its ruler, this internal power of the ruler is there, the discipline, the courage of the warrior, the self-soothing of the caregiver and the impartiality of the sage are what meets the uncertainty of living. Everybody's got a job, but that's what has to occur. The good news, these skill sets can be taught. That's what the good news is, friends. It's incredibly good. The first thing that happens is emotional regulation. Then we go to mindfulness. So you're no longer glued to your thoughts as yourself. Then you learn the historical organization of the, of the committee and what you discover, that's the inner critic and that orphan nature that tends to take over when you're under stress. And then what you're learning to do is to produce this uh, empowered part of the self that's there. You just have to learn to exercise it, to grow it. That's the deal. And this is where the shift happens because when it really comes down to it, Surfing and trading are a lot alike. If you're taking a look at this guy, that's a pretty good sized wave behind him. Do you think he commands that wave? No. Do you think that wave even knows he's there? No. However, 
what that surfer has learned is with skill sets, he can ride that wave and have the ride of his life. But he has to learn the skill set of recognizing that he does not control the wave. What he controls is his performance. He roots that performance in discipline of the ruler, the courage of a warrior, the self-compassion of a caregiver, and the clear thinking of a sage. He confronts the inner critic, silences it, and calms that orphan nature down so that the ruler, discipline, and the sage, impartiality, are the mind that's in charge of the performance. Self-doubt's not there. Grandiosity's not there. Just disciplined impartiality. This is a journey to self-mastery, friends. Who would have thought that trading would force you to face yourself, to reconstruct the self into higher functioning? Well, to get to profitability, you're going to have to. And it's okay if you don't believe me. There are plenty of people that take five, 10 years, and they finally blow up all their capital, and they're gone. And I get calls all the time saying, Randy, I wish I'd listened to you. The key, though, is right now you have a choice. You can say, you know something? I need to get, I need to get my mind together. I need to get my psychological self together so that I can actually bring the edge of the mind to the edge I have in methodology. Friends, that's what, that's what we teach. And what I'd, like to, what I'd like to invite you to, invite you to consider, first of all, if you don't know jack about me, the first thing I'd really like you to do is go to our website and get my free ebook. Read all the articles. Read more. Read more. Uh, watch more of my videos on YouTube. There are over 200 on them. It's just all over the place. Get, get to understand what I'm talking about because what I realize is nobody talks about the neurobiology of change of the, of the brain on uncertainty. And yet at the same time, you finally get to the moment you're going, wow, you know, I've tried everything else. Maybe I need to really look at this as, uh, as the brain, the body, cognition, emotion, even your spirituality are all combined together. How do we start doing this? Once you get past knocking the, you know, kicking tires and things like that, and you say, no, I want to start working on this change. My encouragement is for you to look at our group course. It, uh, it has five meetings with me and webinar meetings. They're recorded and they go over each of the skills we've talked about so that when you walk away from it, you have the basic skills to be able to build a mind to manage uncertainty. Powerful class. And we already have, uh, for the one that we have coming up in September, we already have seven people signed up. And what we want is we want people to sign up early so when they get there, they're very prepared because you sign up and what you get is you have access to at least the first of the programs. And we want you to have emotional regulation down before you start the course. Okay. And what we give is a free gift um, through 9 1. And that's really not to entice you to get into the program, it's there to get you in the program early. There are plenty of people who sign up late and they're overwhelmed by the work because I'm, I'm figuring you're there to work. And I'm there to I'm there to teach. I'm not I'm not I'm not highly desirous of people who aren't really ready to go and say, you know something, I'm going to put the hands to the plow. I'm interested in those people. The other thing uh, and you go right there uh, where you can see the schedule and more information. And we also have a payment system for those people on a budget. So there the individual course, which is you know, one of the things that a lot of people look at is highly comprehensive and personal and is just, it, it covers materials the group course can't. The key though is it's, uh, it comes basically with 10 one hour sessions with me over a period of three or four months on Zoom. That's the big deal. A lot of people just simply want, they want the contact time with me. So it's something where, um, it's a powerful course. People change. So what I want to do is say, this is the invitation. I recognize that everybody wants to do this by themselves and they want to be able to say, you know something, you know, I can do this on my own and I'm only interested in people who see how that's not going to work. 
I also am interested in people who have figured out that this is not an easy way to make money, though a lot of money can be done. And particularly what I'm interested in are people who are actually are in a position where they're saying, you know something, I need to take a look at myself. I need to really work with myself, not just in trading, but across my life. Self-mastery. That's what this course is really about. So check it out, friends. Okay. And now if you have questions, please type them in and um, I'll answer a few. Okay. Um, let's see. Is that a question? Uh, I need to put on a different pair of glasses here. Um, that's one of the problems with aging. You know, your eyes just, they're just not as operational as they used to be. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to, I am going to try to pronounce this name and forgive me up from Tajasi. Tajasi. Taking into consideration the emotional hijacking that can happen, is it better to take a long-term passive approach instead of active short-term trading. What I'll, say, I'll tell you this is that um, day trading is one of the most difficult things you can ever ask your brain to do. Um, and swing trading puts it in a situation where it's more tolerant of the mind, but the day trading calls people. And I, I see both and I see people who are able to really take the bull by the horns and learn to be able to command the body and work with the body and the emotion. And they become very successful in both. But uh, it really, did, um, um, there's nothing passive about day trading, except you do sit there and wait for opportunity and you have to learn how to do that. But that's the, that's the deal, okay? And here's Ron, one I can pronounce. I did the class, the last, the last class, which was outstanding as a late sign up. Highly recommend signing up early to digest the pre-work content. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ron. And it's true is that, you know, just from a conceptual standpoint, what I'm asking you to look at um, is probably nothing you've ever seen before and really begin to understand cognition from a neurobiological standpoint and working with that is it can be jarring. Oh, boy. Uh, Yahangir? Okay. And I'm sorry in advance for what I did to your name. Randy, when I don't over leverage, <laughs> I have a very high win rate on my trades. The problem is you don't really make any money when you don't bet the farm. On the other hand, when I over leverage, I almost always blow up my account. All of this is psychological. I am looking forward to signing up to your self-mastery course. It's good for you. And what I'll say is this, is that um, most of the people I work with, you know, recognize that risking more than 2% of their, uh, their account on any one trade is just an invitation to the black swan showing up and blowing things up. And there is a lot of work and a lot of this, you know, it, and it comes from both places. It comes from evolutionary psychology where we just, our brain's not built for this. And then in our family of origins, those uh, traits get massaged into different ways. Um, but what I'll say is, is that I don't agree is that, um, that you over leverage. What happens is that there is a, there is a, a level of leverage. I have a friend who's a very successful trader and teaches a room where he no longer allows people in his room that don't have enough money to trade. And that cuts out the vast majority. The reason is, is that he knows that you have to have an account about $150,000, $200,000 to be able to keep the risk parameters in line to be able to make good money or enough money to live on. And then it starts going higher. A lot of the people I would work with are you know, they're into the high, they're in the mid and high six figures in their account and some even more than that. And what happens though, is that, yeah, they have the size of the account where 1% risk is reasonable or one and a half percent risk is reasonable for the, get the kind of returns. 
but it's a stepping game. What happens is you, it's like any, it's compound interest. You just keep building, 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 and you don't, you don't use the rush of youth to blow up things and stuff like that. Uh, Arrow, what a cool name. Um, Randy, thanks. I'm listening in from Uganda. We'll listen to you. I appreciate, sir, and wish to meet you one day. Well, thank you, Arrow. It's, um, it may be, who knows, but this thing, the way it goes now is I don't, we don't travel much anymore, okay? And we actually like being able to do this. And I, uh, for those of you who don't know, I, I have had a heart transplant, so I am immune compromised. That was two years ago. And so for us to travel um, the way we used to, uh, that's just not going to happen. But um, I have found this to work pretty good. Okay. Um, Basir. Basir, what kind of daily training or habit would you suggest for a first step to get control over our emotions? Breathe. The very first thing, if you get yourself a mirror or get yourself a video feed so you can watch yourself trade. I mean, just shoulder and shoulders up, that's all. What you will see on your face, and then you will see the shoulder squirm, you will see the tension, you will see the tension around the eyes, you'll see the jaw, you'll see all that stuff, and you'll see yourself stopping breathing. At this particular moment, you know you're being hijacked. The emotions trigger is revving up, and if you don't notice it and interrupt it right then, everything is lost. You're never going to get to the door of the mind. What I encourage, what I encourage is that as you watch yourself, also set a timer so that like every 10 minutes, you look in the mirror and you see what, what's staring you back in the face. And I can promise you that at first it's not pretty, but it's, it's telling you that you don't, you have so desensitized, not you personally, but the human race, the traders, have desensitized them to what an emotion is. The emotion is already boiled over and pretty much is taking over mind before you even notice that it's there. And it's going to whack you that way. So get a mirror, get a video feed on yourself and start noticing it and really start noticing the way you breathe. Um, before, in our group course and in our individual course, you don't see me until you've already done the emotional regulation work because it's rote training. You're learning how to diaphragmatically breathe so you're getting air into the lower lobes of your lungs so that you get more oxygen supply to your brain so the brain can be alert and focused and ready. That's essential. I will practice that around 30 times a day. Okay? It's just natural to me now to check into breathing to check into tenseness because I, I have a lot of residual tension from a pretty traumatic childhood and I have to be careful about the tension build up and to be able to release it bef before that triggers and I start having really what is known in the recovery movement is stinking thinking. So that's what I would consider. And friends, I don't see any other and we have magically hit 5.30 my time and it's time to say goodbye. What I wish for you is I wish for you to be able to find your happiness, your journey through trading, if that's the way it is, and for you to find the tools of self-mastery one way or the other, through me or somebody else or within yourself, so that you really learn that the keys to the kingdom are already there. And as a friend of mine who's made an enormous amount of money doing this says, it's just a pity that people don't get it. It's a pity that they don't get it. They're there. All you have to do is reroute the brain. And I know that's work. But the problem with traders is that they resist. They resist what they have to do to become the trader they are but they magically expect it to change. Friends, my hope is that you find the courage, the discipline, the self-compassion, and the impartiality to build a mind that can trade. I thank you and bless you. Take care.